Now let me introduce Bill Casey. Bill will tell us about the, uh, this great program that the VOTF is launching of Healing Circles, uh, and it's an honor to introduce him. Uh, let me preface this by saying, I, the first thing I have here is that Bill Casey received his BA in philosophy from Villanova University, that's true, but he got a fine high school education here in Boston, a Catholic <laughs> memorial school and uh, of, of great fame and renown, and, and that, that's where our beloved son, Teddy, is currently attending. Teddy is a fresh person at, uh, at Catholic Memorial, and Paul Doucette, one of the legendary principals and leaders of Catholic Memorial, is with us this evening as well, and welcome, welcome, Paul. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but Teddy's worst grade at midterm was his theology grade. <laughs> And not only does he have two parents, theologians, but he's using a textbook that I wrote. <laughs> so if you haven't heard of the cobbler's kids having holes in their shoes before, that's, there's an example of it. But don't tell him I said you that. He's 95 in, math, in uh, art and all kinds of very fine grades. But I said, Teddy, is 68 in theology? I mean. Um, Bill has a BA from Villanova University, has an MA in theology from the Augustinian College in Washington, DC, a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California. He worked for 34 years for the federal government in both executive and management positions, where he was responsible for a wide variety of employment programs. Bill currently directs a restorative justice program for the Northern Virginia Medi Mediation Service, providing service to the Fairfax County Police, Juvenile Court, and school system, one of the largest school systems in the country. Bill also serves as an employment dispute mediator for the federal government and is a certified mediator for the General District Court of Virginia. He served on the board of directors of VOTF for uh, some six years. He also leads a VOTF affiliate in Northern Virginia that he co-founded in 2002, and now is a founding member of this, of this service, this process that he's going to tell us about this evening of Healing Circles. Uh, Bill and his wife, uh, Christine, reside in Alexandria, Virginia. They're married 42 years. They have three children and three grandchildren. Let me just make the parenthetical comment here as a theologian that the whole notion of restorative justice is very much in keeping with the biblical word. And indeed, it actually has a long history in the tradition of the Catholic Church, although it's been often been overlooked. Uh, but for example, and I was sharing this with Bill and Jane earlier, in the old Celtic penitentials of the Middle Ages, uh, one of the principles, the penitentials were a kind of cheat charts that the confessor would take into the celebration of the sacrament of penance to know what uh, penance to assign to what sin. And, uh, but all of the penitentials began with the general principle that contraries are cured by contraries. In other words, if you do something contrary to the law of God, then that's cured by doing the opposite. So an act of, of unkindness is cured by going and doing a loving deed for somebody, the con which is the basic principle of restorative justice. So it's in some ways a new concept to many of us, but it's as old as the church itself, and nobody better to tell, ab tell us about it than Bill Casey. Please welcome him. I must start with a uh, personal story, too. For many years, uh, Tom Groom was a speaker at a, the East Coast Conference on Religious Education held in Washington, D.C. And working on the staff of that conference for all those years, I got to introduce him a number of times. And I was thinking tonight, gee, I wonder what I said. I hope it wasn't something bad, because he, he can now repay the debt tonight. The contrary. <laughs> I want to thank Tom and the Church in the 21st Century <clears throat> for the opportunity to converse with you tonight on a topic known as a healing circle. I'm quite aware of the quality of the speakers that have preceded me in this forum, and I am delighted and privileged to be here. I also appreciate those of you in Boston for holding off the winter storms that you had last winter until I can get back home. Uh, to the Deep South, really not the Deep South, but um, in any event, it's wonderful to be here in this uh, surrounding with all of the traditions um, that come with both Boston College itself and the, uh, the marvelous building in which we're here. So let me start, what is my connection to the topic of healing circles tonight? 
Tom mentioned a little bit about this. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been a professional facilitator in Northern Virginia, working with juveniles and those that they have harmed in order to repair the harm and restore relationships through a process known as restorative justice. These harms have arisen from violations of school behavioral codes that can lead to suspension or expulsion, or to violations of criminal statutes that can lead to prosecution and even imprisonment. I've also been a member and a leader of Voice of the Faithful, the Catholic lay organization that formed here in Boston, out of the urgency of Catholics to respond to the Catholic clergy sexual abuse narrative a narrative that the newly released movie Spotlight brings into sharp focus. In the last three years, I have been a co-leader of a Voice of the Faithful restorative justice initiative known as a Healing Circle, and that's what I hope to talk to you about tonight. My hope is that I can explain what Healing Circles are and their grounding in storytelling, why they are vital to healing the vast wounds from the sexual abuse narrative. And if I hit the mark, how this initiative fits into the faith life in our church and possibly even to, into each of your lives. I'd like to spend the next 25 to 30 minutes on the background to the formation of the Healing Circle Initiative. The restorative justice under, underpinnings of healing circles, particularly storytelling, as Tom mentioned, the theme of the church in the 21st century centers fall semester. Also about the sexual abuse narrative as seen through the lens of a healing circle. And the particular model of a healing circle that Voice of the Faithful calls broken vessels. And that's symbolized for those that you can, can see it in the broken vessel that's at the foot of the podium. Um, that we place at the center of each circle. The Sufi poet Rumi wrote that the wound is the place where light enters you. Songwriter Leonard Cohen wrote in the refrain of his song Anthem, there is a crack, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. After my remarks, there'll be an opportunity for some conversation with you among yourselves in, in the chairs in front of me. And then the remaining time, it will open up to a uh, more general conversation, your questions, your observations, your statements, your endorsements, whatever it is that um, the talk might lead you to, uh, to think about. So first, let me talk to you about the background to the Healing Circle Initiative. Within Voice of the Faithful, a recognition began taking shape during the last several years that opportunities for healing the vast and deep wounds from the clergy sexual abuse narrative have largely been absent in the, life, in the faith life of our church, despite healing being a core gospel value. Certainly, diocesan victim assistance offices have extended care and support to victim survivors of sexual abuse to greater or lesser success as people were interested in that offering. Diocesan or parish healing masses have helped some in the pews. But largely, such efforts have been overwhelmed by the widespread oppositional energy generated by press revelations and pushbacks, lawsuits and bankruptcies, and other confrontational engagements. VOTF leaders discerned that a model of healing based on restorative justice principles and practices was needed to fill this healing void. Truth and reconciliation models such as those used in Rwanda and South Africa exceeded both the reach and also the intention of Voice of the Faithful but other models of restorative justice were feasible. Each of them relies on storytelling and story listening as core elements of the process. 
So began a pilot of Healing Circles in late 2014 and the first half of this year, two of them here in Boston and one in Northern Virginia. Since then, another took place in New York City this past September and one last month in Hartford, Connecticut. Voice of the Faithful's mission with this initiative is to promote, facilitate, and enable broken vessel circles or other healing initiatives on a widespread basis as a means of rebuilding the church out of its wounds from the sexual abuse narrative. Now let me turn to restorative justice, or RJ, as the framework for healing circles. As Tom was mentioning, RJ is not a new age fad, but it evolved from the way indigenous peoples addressed and resolved harm. Their underlying beliefs were that any one individual who was harmed injured the whole community, the harm injured the whole community, and harmony could only be restored by the community at large. This approach is quite different from retributive models, such as our country and others in, first world, in the first world use, where the focus instead is on those who violated a law and punishment the state must impose on the offender. The restorative justice approach is easier to imagine when, let's say, a group of uh, juveniles vandalize some houses in a neighborhood. All the neighbors are affected, even if, the how, if their house was not one of the ones that suffered the, the being vandalized. Many instances of harm, however, involve m much more people than the direct participants in a shared experience. Think of the immediate and ripple effects of a Ponzi scheme perpetrated by someone like a Bernie Madoff or more recently, the shooting of a person of color by a white police officer, no matter where it occurred and notwithstanding the eventual merits of the case. RJ circles can contribute to de healing deep wounds that transcend those directly affected. Now I'd like to look at the clergy sexual abuse narrative through an RJ lens. But first, the disclaimer. Child sexual abuse is not unique to the Catholic Church or to churches in general. Its greatest incidence is in family life. But VOTF's focus with this initiative is on the Catholic clergy sexual abuse narrative. What are the harms and who has been harmed in this narrative? Consider the following individuals whose names I have changed for this purpose. Jeremy, a 40-year-old man, abused as a child, whose life as a victim survivor has been marked by rage and depression, substance abuse, and as with too many others, ended in suicide. Megan and Richard, a couple in their 70s who stay in the pews but feel betrayed by the priest who abused their daughter and further victimized by the dismissiveness of church leaders when they brought the abuse forward. Jim, a cradle Catholic who does not know anyone who was abused but remains incredulous and embarrassed about his trust in hierarchical leaders who engaged in denial, blaming, cover-up, despite records in their files that substantiate what victim advocates or the press reported. Sally and George, a young couple in a new parish who are afraid to let their children near any clergy given the years of disclosures, even though they both had nourishing relationships with priests in their own parishes as children. Martha, a 40-year-old Catholic for whom this narrative was the last straw in her efforts to cling to a faith in which doubts 
left her in a state of disillusionment. Father Tom, a faithful priest for 40 years, who discovers that one of his classmates has been an abuser and who he himself is subjected to disrespect when he wears his collar in public. Susan, a 30-year-old employee at a diocesan office who is shunned when she raises questions about the corporate responses and actions of diocesan officials in response to lawsuits brought by survivors. Peter, a 50-year-old lifelong Catholic and lawyer who is scandalized by the treatment of survivors that he represents in seeking justice from a diocese or a religious congregation. These examples represent harms to specific individuals. But what about the ripple effects on those connected to these individuals, be they family members, fellow parishioners, or colleagues and friends? What about the impact on the whole body of Christ, the painful exposure of wounds in public view for the past 14 years in North America, Europe, Australia, and elsewhere? An RJ approach asks what is needed to heal the wounds. What are the needs and what are the obligations? The first answer for most people is justice. However, its pursuit has, been large, has largely resulted in pitched battles in public forums, the press, the courts, the public square. Struggles for justice have rarely resulted in healing, including for those who reached financial settlements. Those directly harmed often express a need for acknowledgement of the harm, validation that the abuse was not their fault, protection of other minors, assistance in recovery, and accountability. Those in the body of Christ might need full disclosure and ownership of the harm by church leaders, witness of gospel repentance and accountability instead of corporate defenses, or systemic reforms that prevent continuing abuse and cover-up. How does storytelling lead to healing? Howard Zaher, dubbed by many the grandfather of the reawakening of restorative justice in the United States, quotes another author, Robert Schreiter, who says that, we each construct a sense of identity and safety to keep from feeling vulnerable. We place our symbols and critical events in narratives, stories about who and what we are. These are our truths. Zare adds that suffering is essentially an attack on our narratives. To heal, we have to recover our stories that take into account the awful things that have happened. Perhaps we can infer a similar meaning from chapter 12 of Luke's Gospel, where Jesus says, everything that is now covered will be uncovered, and everything that is now hidden will be made clear. So now let me talk about the model of a healing circle. As I said, the voice of the faithful calls broken vessels. It is a facilitated conversation in which participants speak and listen deeply about their stories of harm and healing in a safe space that promotes connection and validation. Prior to the circle, a trained facilitator interviews those who self-identify as people harmed or affected in some personal way by the abuse narrative and who are looking for or open to an opportunity for healing. Or perhaps <clears throat> who are drawn to contribute to the healing of the wounds 
even if not directly harmed. The facilitator also ensures that participants' expectations are aligned with those of a healing circle and that they are ready, willing, and capable of participating without causing further harm to themselves or to others. The facilitator guides the, co the circle conversation according to a very specific set of protocols that are quite countercultural. During the circle, a talking piece, and an example of that is also here in front of the broken vessel, a talking piece, um, uh, excuse me, as a participant, you speak only if you hold a talking piece, which is then passed from one participant to the next. You speak for as long as you need to speak your truth in response to specific questions posed by the facilitator. And you listen if you are not speaking. No interruptions, no cross-talking, no commentary or follow-up questions on other sharings are invited or permitted. This is a very difficult challenge for us in 21st century Western and American cultures. And it leads to a very different kind of conversation. Questions that draw participants to tell their stories about harm and healing include the following. Describe your experience as a Catholic before the abuse scandal broke into your life. What was it like? before you were abused or before you found out about abuses. How has the sexual abuse narrative personally harmed or affected your faith life? How has the harm spilled over into the lives of others in your experience? What has been your experience in seeking or finding healing from the wounds of the sexual abuse narrative? Have there been people or events that have moved or obstructed your journey? And what kind of healing do you yearn for at this time of your life? What do you need in order to move towards it? The responses to these questions are powerful. Participants report a deep sense of being heard, validated, connected, and drawn into an experience of healing. An experience, not full healing. Here are quotations from a few who have participated. Bishop Thomas Gumbleton, a participant in the initial circle, wrote in his homily that he delivered the following day. The healing circle was the people of the church reaching out to other people in the church who had been so traumatically affected. A victim survivor wrote, the healing circle planted a seed that will grow because it is based on truth, fueled by people quickly establishing trusting relationships within the circle. Another participant wrote, I have come to realize that I have experienced hurt in varying degrees on different levels as a result of the clergy sexual abuse crisis. The circle gave me the ability to share another layer of harm. And in sharing my story, I healed a bit more. Now healing circles are not magic wands. They are just opportunities to address harm and continue or begin a journey of healing, individually and through ripple effects as friends and family members, faith communities, and the body of Christ. It may surprise you that healing circles are not about closure, about forgetting, or about forgiving although these outcomes might occur for some participants in a given circle. Nor are circles about, are, are they a substitute for therapy 
or for criminal or civil suits in the pursuit of justice. Before I conclude my remarks and move into conversation, let me read a short poem that we use at the beginning of the Healing Circle to signal a shift from ordinary conversation to circle conversation. It is called When Someone Deeply Listens to You by John Fox. When someone deeply listens to you, it is like holding out a dented cup you've had since childhood and watching it fill up with cold, fresh water. When it balances on the top of the brim, you are understood. When it overflows and touches your skin, you are loved. When someone deeply listens to you, the room where you stay starts a new life, and the place where you wrote your first poem begins to glow in your mind's eye. It is as if gold has been discovered. When someone deeply listens to you, your bare feet are on the earth, and a beloved land that seemed distant is now at home within you. So I'm going to stop there and invite Tom to draw us into the next segment of this uh, conversation. <laughs>